Almighty God, we give you thanks today for our nation's veterans. We honor them for their faithful service in defending and preserving our freedom. We are grateful to those who served during times of peace. standing ready, bravely awaiting their call to duty. We are grateful to those who served during times of unrest. Enduring conflict and bearing the physical and spiritual wounds of war. We ask that you bless them heal their wounds, and give them peace. We thank you, God, for all our veterans, those of generations past and present. May we never forget what our country has asked of them and what they have given in return. Amen. Could we at this time, if you're a veteran or if you're serving even right now, could you just stand? Veterans, could you stand this morning? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We truly are thankful. For our veterans. This is, we live in the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And we can say this. I know there's a lot of things going on in our nation right now, and it's just the enemy attacking. Because this nation has been a beacon of light around the world. And uh, the freedom that we, that we experience, the freedom that we enjoy here, is because of those who've gone before us. And uh, this is an important day to remember them. So we thank you so much for your service. Um, I'm going to be preaching a message today. Oh, this is a message, actually. I'm going to preach a message on the heart of God, having a heart after God. There, there is one person in the Bible who received the title of having a heart after God, and that person's name was David. And let me say this, David was a a fighter, a soldier, a warrior. I know some of these have served in the military. Some people don't even, I, I, I haven't served in the military. I don't know what it's like, but I know there's so many of them that deal with things after they get back home. There's stuff that they dealt with during the service uh, and they don't want to talk about. David was a soldier and a fighter. And yet David was the one person that God gave the title, he's a man after my own heart. I think that says a lot for those people who are fighting. Because David, even though everything that he did in life, you know, the Bible says that he had so much blood on his hands, God didn't want him to build the temple. His son did it, okay? But David, the blood that was on his hands because God called him to do that. Because David was fighting for God. He was a man that God said, he is a man after my own. We're gonna talk today. Pastor came into my office about a month ago, I don't know how long ago it was, and he just asked me, he says, you know, David was a man after God's own heart, but what did that mean? And what was it about David's heart that God looked and said, that's, that's, that's the guy I want? I don't believe David was the only person in the Bible that actually had a heart after God. Actually, I'm looking at a crowd of people right here that I believe that we have hearts after God, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and I believe there's more of them in the Bible, but I do believe that there's a reason why David received that title, and that's what I want to talk about today. But first of all, I just want to talk, well, let me just mention this here. Let me just read this in Acts 13, 21. Uh, this is New Testament. This is, this is uh, the Apostle Paul was telling the story 
of the history of the Israelites. And in part of his story, he brings this up. He said, afterwards, let's talk about the Israelites. Afterwards, they, the Israelites, asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom he also gave testimony. See, this is God given a testimony. God gave the testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. It's one thing for somebody else to say that about you, but it's another thing for God to say that about you himself. That's, that's what I want God to say about me. Uh, he is a man after my own heart. That is quite, and that's what they said about David. Even Old Testament said it, and even New Testament brings it out. And so to talk about this subject of a man and try to, you know, pastor said, what does that mean to have a, a, to be a man after the heart of God? I'm thinking that's quite a, a subject to dig into. You can't hardly cover that in a, in a sermon on a Sunday morning, what it is about the heart of David. But I'm gonna try today just to bring out some stuff Hopefully this will help you. Okay, there was so much, so many things I could say. But first of all, I want to just talk about what, how would you even define the heart of a person? That's the first thing I started thinking when I'm studying this. What is the heart of the person? We know we've heard messages and pastors preached about the spirit, soul, and body, right? How many of you heard of those before? Spirit, soul, and body. Dividing these up, pastors had people up here and one would represent spirit and one soul and one body to try, help us to understand us on the inside. But I'm thinking, okay, if we're a spirit, soul, and body, where does the heart come in? Because the Bible talks about the heart some almost a thousand times it's mentioned in the Bible. I mean, he talks about the heart of a person. And so I just did a little bit of looking and studying on that, okay? So I thought, well, how does the heart differ from the spirit, soul, and body? Or does it differ at all? Or is it a combination of that? And this is what, you know, uh, the Bible said in Romans 9, I'm thinking we need to understand the heart in Romans 9, or excuse me, in Romans 10, 9, and 10, the Bible said uh, we get saved by the words of the mouth, right? And by believing what? In the heart. By believing in the heart, you shall be saved. That's what it says, uh, he says, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we preach that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So it's important that we understand what goes on in our heart. And you know, in studying, I've learned something. There's a lot about our own hearts that we don't even know. You know, David was one person at the end of Psalm 139 he said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Because there is so much in our hearts that we don't know. Have anybody ever had it? Okay, let me say this, because I'm guilty of this. Where you think you're doing pretty good? Come on. How many of you say, there's times in your life you're thinking, I am doing so good. I got rid of this out of my life. I got this out of my life. Hey, I used to do that and I don't do that anymore. I used to get really angry and I don't get angry as much as I used to. You know, I used to hit people all the time but not as much anymore, that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, you're thinking you're getting better, right? And then something happens. You read something in the word and all of a sudden God brings the conviction and you find out, you know something? There's something in my heart that I didn't even know that was there. Because it's really hard sometimes to even determine. Let me, let me read you some things. Let me, let me read you some things that the Bible says about the heart. And this is, this is the, it's talking about the natural state of the heart, okay? Before you're born again, in Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And sometimes, even as a believer... When you think you're doing good, God shows me something. I think, you know something? My heart was deceiving me. It was telling me that I was doing pretty good. When in reality, God is saying, okay, as soon as you start thinking you're pretty good, you're not doing too good because I see pride coming up, right? And pride's not good. You know, and so there's so much going on in your heart that we don't even no. Now, let me read you a definition of what a heart is, according to some of my study guides here. 
Um, when it's talking about the heart, this is what it said. It, it means the mind, soul, spirit, self. For example, the source of life of the inner person in various aspects with a focus on feelings, thoughts, the will, in other areas. In other words, it sounds like the heart kind of involves a lot of what goes on in the inside of you. The way I would best describe it is the heart is actually the combination of your spirit and your soul together. Does that make sense? Because I said it there. I said it's the spirit. It says it's the soul. It's your will. It's your emotions. It's your feelings. All of those things, kind of what's going on in the inside, it's, it kind of covers it all. And that is the part that Jeremiah says, it is so deceitful because it'll tell you things they're not true about yourself. Psalm 44, 20 says, if we had forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hand to a foreign God, would not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Do you know God knows your heart better than you know your heart? And he created you and created who you are. And he looks on the inside, you know, when, when David, you know, David was the one being chosen, was the one God chose and said, he's a man after my own heart. When Samuel went, if you know the story, so I'm assuming some of you know the story, when Samuel came to the house in the home of Jesse, David's father, God sent him there saying, I got, I, I'm rejected Saul as king and I'm choosing another one. And when Samuel went God says, there's one of the children of the house of Jesse is going to be the next king. Samuel says to Jesse, get all your, get all your boys out. Come on, bring them in. So Jesse had, I think, like three. Three sons were in the army, fighters. Came forward, oldest to the youngest. The oldest, Samuel, looked at the first one. Strong fighter, said, this has got to be the one. God corrected Samuel right away. <laughs> Samuel, you only look at the outside. You know, we're really good at looking good at the outside. We like to come to church, and we look really good. We got this smile on our face, right? Got this halo over our head. We're at church, right? <laughs> we, we, are the, we are the one that if you look at it, that's the one that's got it. He's got it all together. And God says, no, Samuel. Man looks at the outside, I'm the only one that knows what's going on in the inside. And, Sam, and they went through all of his boys. And none of them. None of them were the one. And then Samuel says, hey, I know I heard from God. God says this is one of your kids. <laughs> and this can't be all of them. Where's the other one? Well, there's one more. But I didn't bother to take him here because he's just a kid and he's out in the... You know, he's just taking care of the sheep and I didn't think to even bother to have him show up. And Sam says, go get him. And God said, he's the one. Do you know something? God saw what was in David's heart before David had done anything. Do you think that makes, that's something you need to think about. In fact, when God rejected Saul, you probably don't know this. The Bible says that in the second year of Saul's reign, I could probably read it. In the second year of Saul's reign, Saul started making big mistakes. And God said, I've rejected him. But here we just read in Acts that Saul reigned for 40 years. Now, do the math. If God rejected Saul at the second year of his reign, which is what it said in Samuel, 1 Samuel 13, because he made a big mistake and he didn't obey, if he rejected Saul at the second year and Saul reigned for 40 years, how long did it take for God to come and get David in there? That's 38 years, right? Okay, if that's 38 years and David was 30 years old when he was king, what does that say about where was David when God rejected him and chose David? It was eight years before David was born. Think about that. God saw David before he was even born. 
and saw his heart before he was born. Look at people. God saw you before you were born. And he knows your heart. I'm getting really, really off my whole plan this morning. <laughs> all of that's in there someplace. It's just I didn't know how it was all going to come out. But God saw David before he was born and chose him because he said, I'm looking after, for a person who has a heart after me. That, mean God, that means God can see inside you before you were even born. That's quite something. He knows what's inside. See, before David had done anything good or bad, God had already chosen him. You know what that means? That means you getting chosen as a man after God's heart has probably has nothing to do with what you do, good or bad. But it has everything to do with what's going on in the inside here. You know something? You can, you can have good things going on in the inside of you and still make really dumb mistakes like David did. Okay, you know, if I was to choose somebody to be a man after God's own heart, David probably wouldn't be the one I would choose. If you'd say, hey, I'm gonna give you a list of people. How about Joseph or Daniel or Elijah? If you put, if you put them all in a list and say, hey, Joseph, you know, well, in the Bible, he, he didn't do anything wrong. If there's anything Joseph ever did wrong, he was a 17-year-old kid who wasn't really smart and started telling his brothers, you know, I'm assuming you know the story. He got himself in trouble saying, hey, I, I had a dream and I was ruling over you guys, got him in trouble. That's the only thing in, David, in, in Joseph's life that I can even see that would indicate that Joseph had done anything wrong. You can't find things in Joseph's life. You think, why, not, why didn't God pick him? He must have been a man after God's own heart. And, I would, and I'm not disagreeing that he was. He just didn't get the title. You know, Daniel was another Old Testament guy. Didn't do, can't find anything wrong. Elijah, powerful man. None of these got the title of a man after God's own heart. The one that got the title was the one who killed so many people. He's the one that committed adultery with Bathsheba. We all know about that, if you know anything about the Bible. The one that killed Bathsheba's husband to try to cover it up. But you know something? We know about that story, but do you know that David also numbered the people against God's will and 70,000 people died because of it? That's, David, didn't, David did a whole bunch of things. Do you know that David didn't, was, a, was not a very good dad? He had so much going on in his family. He had his own kids raping. One son raped his sister, half-sister. Another son killed the son that raped. He had so much going on. He wasn't the greatest dad. He didn't take care of it. The Bible even says specifically that David didn't confront issues with his own kids. So he wasn't a great dad. Do you know when David was running from Saul, he asked a guy named Nabal, who was a rich man, if he could go through his property. And Nabal said, no, you know what David wanted to do at that moment? <laughs> he was going to wipe them all out. <laughs> David, got, David got mad, and he was impulsive because he was ready to wipe out Nabal and all of the men in his household to take revenge. Okay, now, now that I told you a little bit about David, you think, now, th and this is the guy that God said, he's the man after my own heart. Now, wait, 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 God. I think you, did you forget some things about David? Look at David. Look at, look at Joseph. Sweet little Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he gets thrown in prison. He doesn't do anything wrong. He, whatever he did, Joseph did everything right. You know something? If Joseph would have got that title, you know what we would have said? Well, Joseph got that title because he was such a perfect boy. He never did anything wrong. That's why he was after God. So God only loves people that do nothing wrong like Joseph. Instead, God picks somebody that does so many stupid things, we can all relate to him, right? <laughs> and hey, stupid things he did. All right. Now, is that why God picked him? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just glad he did. Because we know we can all relate to somebody like David. And yet, even before David did the things that he did wrong, God already chose him. David did a lot of good things too. Okay, he wasn't, I mean, he wasn't all bad. But he had so much good and bad mixed in between each other. You'd think he would be bad and then just be good and be good the rest of the time. No, he was good and then he was bad. He was, but none of that mattered because God saw what was on the inside. Okay, God looks at the heart. God looks at 
the heart. Let me, let me go back to, I'm going to go back to Genesis here. I want, I want to talk about a couple of scriptures. Here, in Genesis chapter 6, this isn't about David, but this is the first place that the heart is even mentioned in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 6. And I want to bring that out really quick here because I want to, I want to, I want to show you something here. Genesis 6, verse 5. You know, there's, I've always heard growing up that there's this, what it's called, um, uh, the first time something is mentioned in the Bible, there's truths that you can learn from that, okay? Uh, I can't remember what it's called now. The law of first mention. Thank you. The law of first mention just means when something's mentioned first, there's some things you can learn. And here's the first time that we even hear that of something such as the heart is in Genesis 6, verse 5. And it's actually kind of a sad couple of scriptures here. This is, uh, just happened just before the flood. It says, and then the Lord saw the wickedness of man Saw, excuse me, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now that's not, that's, that's sad, isn't it? Okay, this is, God created the earth. This is right at the beginning. You know, Adam and Eve sinned once and got set in motion sin and evil in the world. By the time this happened, before the flood, God looked at man and said that every thought, every intent of the heart of man was evil only. That's a sad thing. And what's really sad is the next, the next verse. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. Here you see what was in the heart of man. Evil, Right? but also see what was in the heart of God. Grief, okay? Let me say that this is, as I was reading this, this is what the Lord said. He says, the Lord grieved in his heart. It doesn't say that the Lord was angry. And I think that's significant because quite often we look at God and we think when we make a mistake, it makes God angry. But here, the entire world was wicked. And yet, the Bible says the Lord God was grieved in his heart. You know what that says about God's heart? God's heart, God has a heart like ours. Or we, which better that, we have a heart like his. <laughs> we were made in his image, right? Okay, if God was grieved, that means God has emotions, doesn't he? Okay? You, you, sometimes you think, well, God's in heaven. Everything's good up there. God's always happy, always It said he was grieved. The Bible says in the New Testament, we can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. So God was grieved. And I kind of looked it up. I said, what does that that mean, grieve? Someplace in here, I have that actually. Um, We talked about God grieving. And I'm not so sure if I can find it right now or not. It just just meant, because I'm so so far all over my my notes. So I, I don't know. Here's the guy that's always so organized. Uh, it just meant that God hurt on the inside. Uh, oh, wait, grieved, got it right here. A state of emotional distress and sorrow to be filled with pain. God hurt on the inside, was distressed because of what he saw. Why? Because he loved man so much. When he created man and when he created the earth, he said, it is good. It is all good. And here it is. Now, this is quite a few years later, but early on, God said, it is so bad. I am sorry I made her, I made man. That's bad. You ever done something where you got, afterwards you got done, you think, man, I sure wish I wouldn't have done that. I made a big mistake. Here God is saying, I think I made a big mistake. I made man and now it's all bad. And God's heart was grieved. And see, we have a heart after God. Our heart's gonna grieve with the things that God's heart grieves with. And if God's heart grieves with sin, does our heart grieve? with sin? Does our heart grieve when we sin? If we want to have a heart after God, we would have to grieve just like he does. Wouldn't you agree? Okay. And then the next verse, verse seven. Now, the Bible says God was not angry. Okay. I'm not, I'm not 
saying that God is never angry, I think, I mean, the Bible in the New Testament does talk about God being angry. But many times when he gets angry at sin is when he talks to people that should know better and they keep doing things over and over and over again, just like a dad <laughs> or a mom, you know. Sometimes you get angry at your kids because like, I told you, I told you, I told you. Now, this is enough telling you. But here he just says, he was just grieved at that. And then after that, uh, he says in verse seven, and then the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I'm sorry I have made them. God's solution to fixing the problem of everybody is wicked is he had to destroy them because there is no other way to change that. That's sad. Today we have a better way, okay? Because of the blood of Jesus, God does not have to. He did that. And then he said, but verse eight, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know what that means? God saw something in Noah's heart because Noah was not sinless, but God saw something in his heart that says, I can, I can use him. And mankind was not wiped off the face of the earth. You know why? Because there had to come a savior and that line had to be kept going. And it went through the line of Noah because God had a savior plan to redeem man back, to change what was going on in his heart. It's only by the blood of Jesus that our heart can be renewed and changed, our spirit being born again. And every one of us, see, our hearts are not wicked today, okay, because we're born again. However, there's sometimes things get in there that we don't know that only the word of God can expose, okay? And so, anyway, the heart... Uh, the heart of man. Let me keep going here. I am so all over the place. Isn't that fun, being all over the place? <laughs> yeah, except for me. <laughs> We're lost. David had many failures. I talked about that already. David had many successes. I talked about that. Okay, let me just mention, yeah, I can, I, let me just mention some of the things about David's heart uh, that I believe uh, made him somebody that God said, uh, this is what I see in David. David had an absolute faith in God. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. David's heart, even though he'd done so many things wrong, so many good, he did have a faith in God through it all. I mean, right at the beginning of David, right after David got filled with the Spirit of God, got anointed, I mean, him with Goliath is the best example I can think of of David just not having any doubt at all that God was going to come to his rescue. When, you, when, you're, when you're facing an enemy like that and you're just a kid, you know that that person had a faith in God. God saw that. See, because God saw David's heart before he was born, God also saw all the mistakes David was going to make further on, right? Yet at this time, David believed God so much, he could, he could take on the, the giant, Goliath, and not have any doubt the outcome of that. David had an absolute faith in God. That was something that God saw in David. But let me say this. Another thing, number two, David had an absolute love for God's word. And that's so important because it's only the word of God that can do a work to expose what's going on in your heart. And David loved the word. And see, back in them days, all David had was the law. And David said, I love your law. How many people say, I love laws. I love the laws that tell me what I should and shouldn't do. That's David. He said, I love, <clears throat> excuse me, I love the law. Psalm 119, if you read Psalm 119, and that whole psalm is about David loving the word of God. Psalm 119, 47 and I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. Wow, I love your commandments, Lord. <laughs> don't do this and don't do that. Yeah, that's what I love. My hands will also lift up to your commandments, which I love. And I will meditate on your statutes. That was David. He loved the word of God so much. Now, the word of God, let me just turn real quickly to the New Testament, what it says about the word of God if I can find it, because it's someplace in my notes. <laughs> and because I'm all over the place, I don't know where I'm at. But I will find it someplace. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. See, the word of God is like a sword. 
Here it says it's a two-edged sword. See, we use the word of God. We like to use the word of God to come against the enemy, right? Jesus did that, used the word of God. Whenever the temptations came, he had the word of God to fight the enemy. It's an offensive weapon. But here it talks about it's a two-edged sword because the word of God not only is, is to fight the enemy, the temptations, but also the word of God exposes what's going on in us. In other words, it does some work inside of our hearts, okay? It is the word of God, living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing. Now it's talking about not fighting the enemy. It says it's piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. See, if the heart is the combination of your spirit and soul, the word of God comes in there and exposes that, see? And of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. See, even today, we need the word of God to expose what's going on inside here. You see, you know, uh, sometimes when you're in church or Bible study or whatever, the word of God being preached can make you very uncomfortable. Anybody been really uncomfortable sitting in the seats? Because you felt like that pastor knows what's going on in my life because he's preaching right at me. In fact, he looked at me as he was walking. I could see him. His eyes were piercing. See? That's because when the pastor's here, I know everything that's going on inside you. No, I have no idea what's going inside you. Believe me. I can look right at you and not have a clue. But the word that is being preached is doing a work on the inside and it's cutting things up. It is the divider of spirit and soul. It is the discerner of the heart. And sometimes we get real fidgety inside, sitting in the seats. And then you don't want to come to church for the next couple of weeks because you think that the whole church knows what I did because the pastor just talked about it in the service. But that is the word of God. It is like that. And David loved the word of God. And he was the guy that messed up so many times, but he also loved, he actually loved it when he got exposed. Because he even, when, when, when David committed adultery and Nathan came and exposed his sin, what does David do? He writes a psalm about it and it gets in our Bible for the whole world to read. I mean, he's one guy that we all know how many thousands of years later exactly what he did. <laughs> how many of you like somebody to write about your life in thousand years from people reading about your life? Oh, he did that. No, that's what David did because he was not afraid to expose himself to the word of God because he loved the word of God. I think that's something that David did that God loved about him. He had absolute faith in God, but he had an absolute love for God's word because his word is what changes us, okay? And David was totally committed to following God's will. That's what it says in Acts. He says, I'm looking for a man after my own hearts because he will do my will. David was a person that before he did anything uh, fighting, he was a God, how should I do it? And God would give him the direction and David would follow it. That was Saul's mistake. That's why David came to the throne because Saul, God's first choice for king was the one that in the second year of reign, he didn't do things the way God said. He kind of did, but he didn't do it exactly. And that's important too. If you do 90% of what God says and only 10% you sure, that, that ain't it. That, that don't cut it. Not with God, Okay. He's not looking for 90% 90, 90 submission. He's looking for 100%. That's all, he didn't know how to do it. David did. He was totally committed to doing the will of God. David was truly thankful. And that's important because being thankful to God, whatever David was in, he gave thanks. When, when, David's, when David was fighting one time and him and all the guys were gone, an army came, Ziglag was the town, took his... Uh, came into the town, grabbed their, his wives, the wives of the soldiers and their kids and all their stuff and took off. They came back from fighting and the town's gone. And everybody wanted to kill David, if you know the story. Because David was the one leading and they were so upset because all their wives, but what did David do? He says he encouraged himself in the Lord as God. He still knew then that God was the one that was going to deliver him. And he just gave, I can just see David just having a praise session, singing praise like we did this morning praising God for what he's going to do because he was so thankful for his God that was going to deliver him. David was thankful. And then the last time I just put David was, one thing I think this is so important, David was truly repentant. Okay? Let me tell you, you walk the Christian walk, you're going to need to have a heart that is truly, truly repentant. 
because mistakes are going to happen. You know something? If you've got a heart that's truly repentant, God sees that. He sees that heart. A repentant heart is the heart that God looks for. So that was David, heart after God, absolute faith in God, absolute love for God's word, absolutely committed to God's will, absolutely thankful in everything he did, and truly repentant. I think this is just aspects of David that God saw. And if we have those in our lives, we're, we have a heart after God. God grieved at sin. That's the main thing. So I need, I need to close here at this time. I hope this helped you some. You know, it, it's really helped me. There's so much I could said, and even though it was all over the place, I still liked it. It was still good. And so, okay. So anyway, good. Um, by the way, I forgot to tell you right up front, Pastor Paul is preaching up in Gaylord this morning. <laughs> See, my, my, my mind's been all over the place today. I was supposed to do that front. Anyway, and so uh, that's how I got to preach this morning. And so I'm having fun. He sent me a text this morning. He said, have fun today. I said, hey, you too. So I'm having fun. I know he is. Uh, and he'll be back again next week. And uh, so y'all have a good day. The next thing I got to do is I got to close this thing. Yep. <laughs> Why don't you just bow your heads a minute? Uh, I'm just going to close this. Father, you're so good to us. And we thank you, Lord, you're, Lord, you have a heart and we want our hearts to line up with your heart. Lord, and you grieve at sin, Father. We want a heart that grieves with the sin in our life. But Lord, we, we don't want to live there, Father. We want to just rejoice in what you're doing in our lives. So we thank you, Father. I thank you for this message this morning that I could preach. Lord, thank you for helping me get through this. Thank you for helping me to share what was on your heart this morning. Lord, right now, I just pray for the group of people that are here this morning. I pray that their hearts would align with you, Lord. The, Lord, the closer, the more they walk with you, the more aligned their hearts will be with your heart, Lord. And that every one of us, Father, uh, you can say about us all, this, that's a person that's after my heart. Lord, we want that title, Lord. And may we shine your light in this world wherever we go. In the name of Jesus, I just want to say, if there's anybody here this morning and you want to align your heart with God's heart, you know that God is speaking to you this morning. You know that there's something going on in your heart that God has been touching through his word. And you know that you, maybe you've never in your life submitted your life over to God uh, and his son, Jesus Christ, and received the forgiveness of your sin. If you're here this morning and you say, that is me, never given my heart over to God, and I want to do it this morning, could you just raise your hand? Because this is your time. This is how you get saved, by believing in your heart that Christ raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. Is there somebody? Any, can I raise, say your hand? Okay, I see a hand over there. Good, very good. Thank you. Is there anybody else that's this morning you say, that's me? I want to submit my life over to the Lord. If there's anybody watching on the, the internet this morning, you can do this right now. Why don't with all of us with our eyes closed, our heads bowed, let's just pray. What we're gonna do, we're just gonna pray a prayer, and this is just a prayer of submission to God and his ways. Uh, and when we do that, the Bible says, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts, Christ raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. And we're gonna do that this morning. So let's pray with me. Say, Dear God, Dear God. I come to you in the name of Jesus. Uh, I submit my life to you this morning. I believe that Jesus died and rose again and paid the price for my sin. And I have sinned and I need to be forgiven. You said in your word that if I would call Jesus Lord, I would be saved. So now Jesus, I call you Lord. I submit my life to you. I want my heart to be like yours. Fill me with your spirit. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for setting me free from every sin I've ever committed. I submit my life to you. And I want to live for you for the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Very good. All right. Those who prayed that prayer for the very first time, if you prayed this prayer for the very first time, there's something we want to get into your hands. We do have, if you want to put that up there, you can take your phone and text 41411, got saved, one word, got saved to 41411 on your phone, uh, and you can get information 
uh, and you can get a devotional from Pastor Paul. You can get a devotional uh, booklet to read. All of that's on there. Or you can go to our website uh, and uh, look that up also. Or you can fill out the Connect card and just say, hey, I got saved this morning, and we'll put you into that. Uh, and you'll be getting those emails, one email uh, every day for the next seven days. Um, that's, that's for you. So there, you can make sure you do that. And then I've got, um, could you hand me, I think I got something in here. We have a team of people that pray every week for the services. And when they pray, they, the Lord gives them things in the area of healing and freedom for each service. And so this service here, 9 a.m. today, um, these are the areas of healing, joint pain, arthritis, lower back pain, sinus infections, ulcer, and hearing restored, okay? If you're dealing with any of those things, God's got you pegged this morning, come forward for prayer or just receive it right in your seat. You can do that too. And then in the area of freedom, fear, freedom from fear, finances, and addictions. Those are the ones this morning. So we'll have a team of people up in the front to pray with you this morning to take care of all that. The rest of you, thank you so much for coming. You're a blessed church. We'll see you on Wednesday.